Faster Than Light is one of the greatest games of all time. It doesn't look like much, but the simple top-down view of an empty spaceship with grid-based movement hides an incredible amount of strategic depth. I have played so many hours of this game and have never beaten it on any mode other than easy. In hindsight, starting the game on the easier setting was a bad move, because by the time I was able to defeat the final boss, I'd developed so many bad habits that the moment I upped the difficulty, even the simplest enemy ships were owning me. Now, whenever I play roguelike games, I start them on the maximum difficulty, because for me, that challenge is where the fun lies in these games, and it gives a better, slower pace to my progress. The reason that FTL is so enjoyable is that you have so many decisions to make. Where do you go? A friendly system or a hostile one? When you're in that system, do you sprint for the finish, or do you slow down and explore? What systems do you want on your ship? Which systems combine well with your crew? Which systems should you upgrade? Which did you upgrade first? Do you upgrade any? Or do you hold on to that precious scrap in case you stumble upon a shop full of delightful treasures? And all of these decisions matter. When games are turn-based, or real-time but pausable like Faster Than Light is, then the true measure of the game is how many interesting choices can you make. The answer in the case of Faster Than Light is... Lots. Lots and lots. Faster Than Light really is a masterpiece, and because of its simple graphical style and intuitive controls, it's going to stand the test of time. If you have never played this game before, you should pause this video and buy it right now. So when the developers of FDL announced that they were making a second game, I was incredibly excited. The second game was titled Into the Breach, and the idea behind it was to create a quick, turn-based strategy roguelite with a mechs versus monsters theme. You visit various regions across two, three, or four islands, each with their own common enemies and disasters. Every location is a small grid littered with buildings, mountains, water, and occasionally rare features like dams. The buildings are all connected to a power grid, and if the buildings are damaged, so is the power grid. This collateral damage is your health bar in the game. If your power grid depletes to zero, you lose. However, if you lose, and this is where the roguelite element comes in, one of your crew members will travel into a breach in time to where the game begins and give humanity another chance at survival. And that is why the game is called Into a Breach in Time. Into the Breach markets itself as a turn-based strategy game, and that term was parroted heavily by many reviewers. But really, that doesn't give anyone a good idea of how the game actually functions. Sure, the game takes place in turns, and I guess that moving military units in a battle is technically strategy, so I'm not going to be complaining to the Advertising Standards Agency about this. But in video games, we know what turn-based strategy usually means, and I think it gives the wrong idea about what Into the Breach is going to be. Think about an actual turn-based strategy game, like XCOM, Sid Meier's Civilization, or as you're seeing here on the screen, Double Fine Productions' 2015 title, Massive Chalice. In all of these games, you have lots of options about how to play. I can choose to attack very aggressively, sending multiple units forward to engage, or I could use ranged attacks to aggro individual enemies and pick them off one by one. I could also take a turn to pause and heal up my squad, making them stronger for when I do go forward. I've got a wide range of options with where to move, who to target, and which attacks to use, and I get to plan what I think will be the strongest way to do that. So back to Into the Breach. The board is very small, and enemies are always close enough to do damage to your buildings. This means that every turn in Into the Breach has to be aggressively sending all your units forward to attack. There isn't really a choice there. When you take a turn in Into the Breach, you have the enemy actions telegraphed to you. So instead of having to consider potential attacks and plan for them, you know exactly what's going to happen. You can identify the threats immediately. If an enemy is attacking a building, it needs to be killed or moved. If an enemy is doing anything else, you can ignore it this turn. In other games, choosing where to attack is part of the strategy. In Into the Breach, it's just dictated to you by the game. So what is Into the Breach if not a turn-based strategy game? Well. It's a mini puzzle solver with a sci-fi theme. What Into the Breach really feels like to me is those chess puzzles you can find in newspapers, where it gives you a board with some pieces on it and says, White's turn, checkmate in three moves. If you aren't familiar with these, let me quickly show you here. So I am black here. This puzzle wants me to win in three moves. Because there's only one solution to the puzzle, 
I know that I must somehow be in control of White's turn as well as my own. And there's only one way that you can do this in chess, and it's by checking the enemy king. So now I know that for my first turn, all I have to do is find a move that can put the enemy king in check. And looking at this board, I can only see one, which is moving this knight from this tile to here. And there we go. That's going to be turn number one. The king had to move to here because this is checked by the knight, this is checked by this knight, this is blocked by this pawn, and this was blocked by the rook that was just taken. So the king has to move there. So now I've got to look for other moves that check the king. I've got to keep going, just finding new moves that check the king. There's only one, again, that I can see. Well, actually, there's two. I could either move my pawn here and turn it into a queen, but that's incorrect. So let's start off with this move again. And then the second one is moving this knight into here, and that's another check. And then I've got two options. I could get this queen, but it would be taken, or I could just bring this knight down, and there we go. We won the game. That's checkmate. I only needed to make one logical step to solve this puzzle, and that was look for moves that check the king. There won't be many possible ways to put the king in check, and so I can just go through the moves one by one until I find the correct solution. And there it is. Easy. My main point here is that this is not how real chess is played. It's a simplified puzzle using the ideas of chess. So, there were three steps here. One, solve the puzzle, which is target the king. Two, Look through all the moves which attack the king, and then step three, select the correct moves. Here is a turn of Into the Breach. Your health bar is the buildings, so the most important part of any turn is preventing building damage. And that's step one, solve the puzzle, prevent building damage. Step two, look through all moves which target enemies who are attacking buildings. Step three is exactly the same, select the correct moves. And there it is. Into the Breach requires the exact same process as a newspaper chess puzzle that everyone ignores while they're doing the Sudoku. So to call back to what I said before, this is not how real turn-based strategy games are played. It's a simplified puzzle using the ideas of a turn-based strategy game. Now you might say, but Table 53, a chess puzzle has a predetermined solution. Into the Breach doesn't, so how can you say the correct moves? And you have a point ish. In Into the Breach there could be multiple ways to prevent an enemy causing building damage, but let's take a look at how a lot of turns actually play out. So we know that the focus has to be enemies which are going to deal building damage, and here in this turn every single Vec is attacking a building. This guy is shooting one damage into this building, this one is shooting one damage into this Earth Mover, which is one of those special items that can appear in levels, and if we defend the Earth Mover we get an extra star. And this Vec over here is looping a shot into this building. So let's go enemy by enemy and see what we can do about it. So let's say this guy over here. What I could do is I could send my fighter jet over to this tile, loop over the top of it with my attack, and drop smoke on it, preventing this Vec from attacking. This guy, what his attack is, is he can, if you look at it there, push all the enemies away from him from one tile away. But unfortunately, I can't get close enough with this, with this mech. So I'm not going to be able to attack this enemy, so he's not useful. And this guy deals a missile, can fire a missile in a straight line that pushes the enemy back one space and deals two damage. But unfortunately, I can't get into the same row as this Vec, so I can't deal any damage with the missile monster either. So what it's going to have to be is it's going to have to be the jet. It's going to have to come to this tile, jump over the top, and prevent him from attacking using smoke. Now let's look at this guy over here. This Vec is going to deal one damage with a looping shot onto this building. I can get close enough with my four-legged mech in order to bounce the guy, but unfortunately this is just going to bounce him into a mountain. He'll take one damage, but he'll survive and he will still be able to shoot this building. So that's not really good enough. My missile mech, on the other hand, could come all the way over to here and shoot two damage from a missile from distance killing the Vec and preventing him from dealing any damage to this building. And that means I've now got one mech left and there's one Vec left still attacking. So I can move onto this tile and boop the guy down the hole. And there we go. So now we've taken no building damage this turn. That was the correct set of moves for this turn. And this is the biggest disappointment because it looks like I've decided what turns I'm going to make, but I don't feel like I've made any decision at all. My logic is that building damage must be mitigated, and based on that logic, this was the only set of moves available to me. The game presented a scenario, and I plugged in the corresponding counter moves. 
and unfortunately this is what almost every turn of Into the Breach felt like to me. I wasn't orchestrating a defence against the alien invasion, the aliens were dictating my moves as though my crew were three giant metal marionettes. It all felt so... computational. Don't get me wrong, computational works for some people. I know it does because I'm one of them. But overall, Into the Breach was just too simple. Only three units, only one attack per unit. It didn't take very long to solve most turns, and so it very quickly became repetitive. If you want an idea of how a game based on reacting to telegraphed enemy actions should be made, then the board game Spirit Island is exactly what you need to see. In Faster Than Light, your ship is constantly progressing as you play. There are so many weapons you can acquire, so many levels of strength for your ship's systems, and a variety of augments to boot. Not only that, but you can have crew between one and six people, and each of those crew members come from distinct races with different strengths and weaknesses. And they all have attributes that improve if they work in relevant systems. A crew member assigned to the weapons room will become a more competent weapons specialist, and so on. In Into the Breach you have three crew members and they each drive a mech. The crew members don't have any specific attributes, and during fights they gain generic experience. With enough experience, the pilot can level up twice, and gains a bonus that was predetermined at the start of the game. Some of these can be quite useful, like an extra upgrade point for your mech, whereas some of them aren't, like the measly 3% increase to your grid defence. Seriously, who decided that this bonus would be a good idea? Grid defence is basically the percentage chance that damage dealt to a building won't occur. You usually have about 7 grid health. With no grid defence, it would take 7 enemy attacks to kill you, assuming all buildings had only 1 health, although this isn't actually true. You get 15% grid defence by default, and that means that on average you expect it to take about 8.2 enemy attacks on buildings before you're killed. With a 3% defence bonus, this increases to a whopping 8.5 expected attacks before death. If you sacrifice your other upgrades and manage to increase your grid defence all the way up to, say, 30%, you would still expect to die in 10 enemy attacks, and grid defence as high as 30% is not easy to achieve. That's also a best case scenario, as many buildings have more than one hit point, and most enemies are capable of dealing more than one damage in an attack. So in reality, the grid defence bonus is even weaker than my simulation makes it look. Did no one on the developer team run the numbers on this, or did they actually think that this bonus was balanced in comparison to some of the others? All right. Clearly, I got a bit too obsessed with that, it's not that big a deal, it's just a bit dumb. But the upgrade system in Into the Breach is really poor. While in Faster Than Light you are constantly upgrading various components of your ship, in Into the Breach you can only upgrade your mechs once you complete an island. There are only four islands in the game, and so you can only upgrade your crew a maximum of four times in an entire playthrough. Fewer if you don't go to all the islands, and most of the time you won't. This doesn't give you anywhere near as good a sense of progression for the style of game that Into the Breach is trying to be. The upgrades also don't feel like much has changed. Gaining an extra movement or health makes you more powerful for sure, but that improvement is hidden in the background. An extra tile of movement doesn't feel very different in the gameplay. The biggest change should be when you purchase a new attack for one of your mechs. But even this is limited because you can still only complete one action per turn per mech. And so a lot of that time, that flashy new attack you just bought, well, you won't be able to use it. Now, I've made this its own separate point, but really this is just a consequence of the simple puzzle solver gameplay coupled with the lackluster upgrade system. At the start of this video, I mentioned that I always play roguelike games on their hardest difficulty setting. This is to get what I think is the game's true experience. With Into the Breach, I put the game on its hardest difficulty setting immediately so that I could see what the game had to offer. And I did. I saw everything the game had to offer. On my first playthrough, I reached the final stage of the final battle and lost one turn away from victory. On my second playthrough, I beat the game. In Faster Than Light, I was forced to explore many strategies. I had to try out boarding and cloaking and drones, and it took a while before I had an idea of how to play with each of these different styles. I had to make mistakes and learn from them. Into the Breach just didn't have that. The depth in Into the Breach is almost entirely found in unlocking new units. And at first this was exciting. I wanted to get enough points to unlock the smoke units and the fire units and the weird shield units. Now, if I finish a game and desperately want to replay it as the same character or class, 
It's because I love how the game played and I want to explore everything it has to offer. But if I only want to try out new classes, maybe I'm enjoying the novelty more than the game itself. Into the Breach is also very much all or nothing. Whereas in Faster Than Light you can be heavily beaten and bruised by a fight, limping through space with low fuel, mourning your deceased crew members, and having taken so much damage that your ship is being held together by duct tape. And you can bring it back. You can find a shop, you can repair your ship, you can hire new crew and give them the same names as the ones who just died. Sometimes it won't happen. You'll limp into another fight and your ship will explode. But you know there's a chance and it keeps you motivated. If a crew member dies and in into the breach, you can just give up and start again. The rest of the game will not be worth playing. You won't have enough options in a turn to counter the enemy actions. Your mechs will take more damage now that there are fewer of you to bear the brunt of attacks and you'll just get weaker and weaker. So that's my opinion. Faster Than Light is incredible. But as much as I respect the developers for the incredible job they did in making that game, I can't help but be disappointed by Into the Breach. I don't regret buying it, because for the number of hours I've spent playing Faster Than Light, the total cost of the two games combined is still a bargain, and hopefully they can make another great game in the future. Into the Breach uses the mechanics of turn-based strategy games in a simplified way to make a small sci-fi themed puzzle. While it can start out quite enjoyable, there just isn't enough depth to the strategy or story to have enough replayability for the type of game it wants to be. This review might feel unfair, and perhaps I haven't spent enough time reviewing Into the Breach as its own game, and I spent too much time comparing it to Faster Than Light. But I believe that if I had written this as a review purely for Into the Breach with no comparison to Subset Games' past works, that I would have had the same criticisms. While this game really hasn't charmed me, I'm still a fan of subset games because making a title as good as FDL is an achievement that almost no other game developers can boast. But as much as I wanted to love this game, I can't recommend Into the Breach.